Workplace abuse affects not only the employees, but also that person's family and friends. They too ride the roller coaster of emotions with you and likely have experienced some form of workplace trauma themselves. I've been asked to speak on several platforms, including Super Speak Sundays with James the Orator. Here's our conversation, which kicks off our year discussing solutions to workplace abuse. Welcome to another episode of Super Speak Sundays. I'm your host, James the Orator. And as you know, we just identify ordinary people who have gone on to do extraordinary things. And today is no different. We will continue to bring the stories and the information that are going to be transformational, not just to my life, but to your life as well. We want to see change. We want you to do things that you've never done before. Sometimes we have to be comfortable being uncomfortable. And that's the way that we grow in this thing we call life. And so today, like no other, you know, we continue to bring guests on who are willing to tell their story and share information that, again, is transformational. You know, this guest today, had, we, we've had her on before, and she was on with her dad, Andrew Moorhead. If you remember, those of you who are from Indianapolis, you've seen her time and time again you know, on our 10 o'clock news, 5 o'clock news. I mean, she, she was the face of Indianapolis. But you know what? Today we have her on. And we're gonna, she's gonna tell us some things that you may not know. And so let me first start off by reading her bio. Uh, get some popcorn because it's good information. <laughs> Andrew Moorhead, an Emmy Award winning journalist, spent 21 years as the main weekday evening anchor of the 5 p.m., 5.30 p.m., 6 p.m., 10 p.m and 11 o'clock p.m. broadcast at NBC WTHR in Indianapolis, Indiana. She has field experience worldwide in national events, including the 2009 presidential inauguration of U.S. President Barack Obama, the 2002 Final Four in Atlanta, the 2002 Winter Olympics in Salt Lake City, Utah, the 2000 NBA championship in Los Angeles, California, and the 2000 Summer Olympics in Sydney, Australia. On June 5th, 2020, Andrea anchored her last newscast after literally walking off the job without warning. She now speaks about navigating environments that disrespect, mistreat, and marginalize women and people of color and the negative effects it has on their physical and mental health. As a result, she has created her podcast. She's the host of this podcast, and it's entitled My Silence is Not for Sale. The platform provides an opportunity for people to highlight untold stories of, of those who have stood up to negative workplace environments and succeeded in reclaiming their lives. She is currently writing two books entitled My Silence is Not for Sale, Candid Conversations and Solutions for hostility, microaggression, and gaslighting in the workplace. And another book called Move Over Hamster, Microaggressions and Gaslighting. I'm sorry, Move Over Hamster, There's a New Sister in Town, a 10-step guide to reclaiming your soul and indulging in respite now, which is co-written by psychologist and therapist, Nakisha Tolbert Banks. Andrea is also a co-owner of the curated beach accessory brand, Minnesota Moments, which celebrates self-care, emotional, and physical wellness. In January 2022, she published her first children's book, The Brightest Star. And if you go back to our archives, you'll see this episode with Andrea and her father. It was a powerful, powerful episode. And it highlights her father's albinism. The book encourages people of all ages to celebrate differences and to be kind to one another. In April 2018, Andrew was diagnosed with triple negative breast cancer, which is now in remission. As a result, she now serves as a board member for Pink Forever Ending Disparities, which seeks to reduce breast cancer, late stage diagnosis, and death rates for Black women in Indianapolis. 
She is also a board member for Morning Light, which provides end-of-life care for financially insecure residents, and Indie Hygiene Hub, which supports families with basic household needs. Ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome our guest today, Miss Andrea Moorhead. Hello. Andrea. Hello, hello, hello. How are you doing today? I am fabulous today. How are you? Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Well, you know what? It's your life. <laughs> it's your life. So I, I, I read exactly what you have been I, doing in life. You know, what, what have you been up to since uh, our last interview? I know we had um, uh, your dad. I mean, you, you, you guys talked about albinism and mm -hmm. the impact it had on his life, um, the things he, he went through as, as, you know, being an albino. And so what mm -hmm. have you been doing since that time? Oh my goodness, I don't even know where to start. Let's see, what have I been doing? Hmm, I've been trying to save every black woman in America. <laughs> that's a task, that's a task. That's a task, that's a task. That's a task. that is that's a, a task. task. Yeah, you know what, I've been busy working as the anchor, if you will, for Rejoice Financial. So I come back to Indianapolis about uh, once a month for about three days, and I do stories about nonprofits in Indianapolis and across the state telling the wonderful stories about what they're doing in our communities and how you can give your money, you, how you can also volunteer to help those nonprofits continue to thrive. And I'm also, you might notice every once in a while, if you ever are watching HSN, I am a brand ambassador for a number of home decor and clothing brands. So yeah. I'm just having a phenomenal time. And of course, as you mentioned, I'm writing as well. So I'm busy, busy, busy. And I'm this loving stuff. every minute of my life now because I literally am choosing who I work with. And that is, that's not a privilege. That should be the right of everyone for us to choose who we work with. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I, I can tell, I mean, there's a glow that you have about you. You know, before we, before we came on, you were in the, in, in the, in the purple room. And I just said, Hey, you know what? There's a, a new glow about you that, that I see that, you know, that no one can really take away. No, but you know, I want to get to the, I want to get to the meat and potatoes of this. Many oh, yeah. people are seeing you right now, and they're saying, you know what? We came home and watched her every day mm -hmm. because she was the person who really represented anchors in Indianapolis. I can't wow. tell you how many times I've I've gone to coffee shops, I've gone to mm -hmm. grocery stores, and I've seen people who I know and say, hey, what happened to Andrea Moorhead being on on the news? I mean, yeah. you were that you were that one, and so I, I think that, and I know you've been doing your thing on your podcast, but mm -hmm. I, I think that people want to know um, why you, you know, mysteriously just disappeared from from, from the limelight. I totally disappeared. I mean, literally, when I say I dropped the mic, I literally dropped the proverbial mic, the real mic. I literally walked out, and it was, you know, for my my podcast, my silence is not for sale. One of the first things that I say to everyone is, I'm sorry. My departure was not the kind of departure that I would ever want for anyone. I never thought that that would be the way that I would leave, but I literally had to walk away from the career. Now, I won't say the career. I'll, I walked away from the job because the career, I still have the career. Mm -hmm. um, you know, No one can take away the gifts and the talents that God has given me. But I walked away from a job because the job was, the environment was toxic. It was a hostile work environment. And on my podcast um, slash YouTube show, mm -hmm. I am literally outlining what I endured for over 15 years. I mean, when I got there, I was 29 years old back in 1999. I came in wow. as a 5.30 in the Tempium Anchor. And here I sit in front of you as a 54-year-old woman. I mean, I was there for 21 years. Wow. And when I think about how you all, the people in Indianapolis and across the, around the state of Indiana, you all really allowed me to grow up in front of you. I mean, I came in as a little baby. I was a newbie and I was so excited and full of life and so you know, full of vigor and excited about being in my hometown, working as an anchor. And over the years, I was promoted. Um, and we'll get to, to that a little bit later sure, sure. in terms of why I also left was because of the hostile work environment. It just got to the point where I have been holding so much of the turmoil inside. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that it made me sick. I know the stress stressors and the stress and everything that I was going through made me sick. That's why I got cancer. And I don't care what anyone says. They're like, no, that doesn't happen. Yeah, it does. 
it, there's a reason why it's called disease or, or yes. you have a disease. It's because your body is not at ease. It is diseased. And for 15 years, I was going through a silent battle that only my mom and dad and my family and very close friends like you all, you all knew about. Um, it was a very well-guarded secret. So while people saw me on the air laughing and, you know, doing what I do, being who I am, I was natural. That was me. I was authentic, but I was battling a very silent, silent battle behind the scenes. And that was dealing with the microaggressions, the lies, the gaslighting, the lack of promotion, or when I finally got a promotion telling me that I was not going to get the financial promotion and reward that comes along with it. And over a period of time, the aggregate of all of these experiences just really affected my mental health. I mean, I can't put it sure. any other way. I sure. literally, sure. at some time, sticks. I was, I could literally see my body at the bottom of the mountain. Like I could see mm. it and one wow. of my foot was leaning on the edge. And I just sure. told Archie, I said, hey, something's going on. I said, I don't know what else to do. Stories that I had written. Um, were taken away from me stories that were completed were lost and all of a sudden i would have to go and reshoot stories that were slated to air i was told we're not going to air them without giving me really any explanation so here i am working struggling to do my job and the powers that be were intentionally preventing me from doing my job and it was only in what was this maybe it was may of 20 May of 2019, when something very egregious happened, and I just, I said, I, I, I got to go talk to someone because, you know, I can pray as much as I can pray. I've got faith. You know, my mom and dad are pastors. I was talking right. to my husband and talking to Archie and my mom and dad, and I just couldn't figure out how do I navigate this environment. And I said, I got to go see someone because I don't know if I'm going to make it. When sure. I tell you that my soul, my soul was, was broken, my mm -hmm. humanity have been stripped away from me, from all of these egregious and unconscionable behaviors. I just couldn't do it anymore. And I went to a therapist and for over a year and a half, almost two years, I saw four different experts, if you will, in the therapy sure, field, sure. Um, just to understand, is this me? You know, is this all in my head? Am I making a big deal out of it? Am I, am I being, um, Am I not being fair to other people because of how I feel? Are these feelings legitimate? And I had to go see people to help walk me through all of these transgressions by other people sure. to understand that what I was dealing with. And I'm telling you, when I say it, it was a light bulb moment. Sure. My, my therapist said, honey, you have been enduring classic abuse. Mm. And when she said the word abuse, it just clicked. I went, you're absolutely right. But let me tell you, that very first time, I was nervous seeing a therapist. I didn't know. I had never been to a therapist before in my life. Um, I didn't know that my mental health was suffering. I think intellectually I knew it, True. but I, I didn't know it, know it. I just knew something didn't feel right, and I knew my body was reacting to the negativity. And when I went in, in to, to Miss Mashara Winston, who I will tell you, Mm -hmm. literally saved my life and saved my soul. And I, I'm wow. going to actually have her on the podcast to talk about sure. what we talk about, because I think it's important for people to understand the questions and, you know, the probing and what, a, what going to a therapist really entails. Sure. And you know, in the black community, a lot of us, we are told, you know, just pray, just pray it away. It's going to go away. That's right. That's That's right. you. you know, we put our faith and I'm not saying that we shouldn't have faith. Obviously we should, but I needed someone to, to hear me, who was objective, not my family member, not my pastor, not my husband, not my sister, not my right. in-laws. I didn't need family. I needed someone who was totally objective, who didn't know my story until I told her what was going on. And for her to objectively listen and put herself in my shoes and objectively help me to understand that what I was going through was abuse. And yeah. when that moment came, when she said that word, I literally said, you're exact. That's what it is. And wow. in my mind, I began really working on myself, working on my own level of courage, working sure. on my own internal reservoir, knowing when I needed to speak, when I didn't need to speak, knowing how to take care of, you know, information, things that were happening, 
saving text, saving emails, all of that. Sure. Not that I was trying to build a case, but I wanted to make sure that I had all of the pertinent information that I needed because I knew that how I was being treated was wrong. Sure. It was wrong. It was simply wrong. It was racist. It was discriminatory. It was gaslighting. It's all the X's, or should I say the isms that you can think about. That was my situation. And, yeah. you know, I tell people, say, well, are you afraid? I'm like, what, what do I have to be afraid of? You know, one thing people need to always understand is the truth is always a defense. Absolutely. They can lie all they want to, but the truth is always a defense. And they want to go to court, take me to court because I got right. the truth. But they're never going to do that because they know what they did was intentional. Sure. And so I'm spending my time now really helping other people. I want to share my story so that other women, especially black women, other people, because this is really a people problem. Sure, sure. And, you know, from a people problem, there's also that separate racial discriminatory problem that goes on for us as black women and black men and people of color. And I just wanted to add some real context and real storytelling to the reality of what so many of us go through and we suffer from it and we suffer in silence and we don't talk about it. I mean, we talk about it to each other, like, right. girl, listen, these people, or, you know, you're sitting in the parking lot <laughs> before you walk in and you're like, Oh right. Lord, a shield. And, you know, you're putting on right. a full armor of God trying to walk in because you yeah. know, you're going to be dealing with the microaggressions. And as much as we try to navigate around it, it really begins to mess, if you will, with your mind. It affects yeah, your yeah. it affects your mental health. And so that's where I am right now. I'm all about yeah. helping us understand the realities of, of microaggressions, gaslighting, um, you know, hostile work environments. Sure, it's really sure. workplace bullying. And you know, seventy six point three million people around the nation are dealing with workplace bullying. Over thirty yeah, percent. Yeah of people are dealing with it on a daily basis. And yet we don't talk about it. It's yeah, like this little yeah. thing, like we know what's going on, but nobody wants to talk about it. No one wants to hold people accountable because yeah. companies are concerned with mitigating their liability, meaning the financial right. stance, if you will. They don't want, they're like, oh, we don't knew, we don't see anything or they don't do anything because they believe that if we don't respond to your emails, if we don't do anything, then it never happened. And yeah. I'm just, I'm never going to be the person who allows someone to dictate my life in that way. And for me, it was a moment of courage. It was a moment of saying, how do I want to live the rest of my life? You know, That's right. I, going through cancer, thank God I'm still in remission. And I kept saying, so I've got through this battle. Now I got to go back to work to battle with these people. Yeah. Mm -mm. I yeah. Scott says, no, that's not, that's not what I have for you. This is, sure. Your ability, you have a right to thrive. Thriving is not a privilege for a select few. Thriving should be for everyone. And I literally walked out on June 5th, 2020. It was the, the last story I did was about George Floyd. And wow. for me, it was a moment of there's no better way, no better time than to leave than right now. Because sure. that whole moment represented for me not being believed like George Floyd when he said, you know, what are you doing? When he said, yeah. I can't breathe. And that I, can't breathe, right. I can't breathe. I felt like I literally could not breathe. And wow. Wow. after that story, it, it aired during the six o'clock PM broadcast. I was done at six 30. My, it was a Friday night. My producer called me and says, okay, that was a great job. I had a part two that was supposed to air at 11 o'clock. And in that moment, Dix, literally God spoke to me and said, wow. This is it. Wow. Because it was so appropriate for me to leave sure. with a story that literally spoke volumes about who I am as a person, how I was feeling, what I was not receiving. I wasn't being believed, my dignity, my humanity. I wasn't being sure. respected as a person. And I just said, I'm out. I'm done. And I walked wow. downstairs. I hadn't even told Archie. Nobody knew because it was a in the moment moment. Sure, sure. In the moment decision. And it was 637. I remember looking at my phone. I hung up the phone. She says, let me know what you're going to be doing for the weekend. Send me an email and we'll talk about what you're going to do for Monday. And I said, okay. She says, well, let your love, your piece for tonight at 11 o'clock run by itself. Meaning I'm, I don't have to be on the 11 o'clock show sure, to sure. introduce it or tag it out. And I said, that's perfect. 
And I hung up the phone and I just, I walked downstairs. I told Archie, I said, call our attorney. I'm never going back. Yeah, called yeah. the next day that Saturday morning and said, Andrew is never coming back. And I've never stepped back inside that door. Wow. Wow. You know what? Historically, we, we've, we've been, we've been taught and, and, and I'm not going to say it, all of us, but some of us have been taught to uh, assimilate and acculturate with, you know, environments that may be uh, uh, toxic. And so, and so, and so, as a, as a black man, as a black woman, we have to say, well, if, if we're going to feed our families, these things must be required for us to uh, uh, be able to fit into the box that's been created for for us in, in terms of organizations. And so, there may be someone who's saying, "Hey, you know what? You know, I'm 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 not going to call say token, but I'm the person who, hey, I'm trying to climb the corporate ladder. I don't care about you know all this." What do you say to that person? Because you know what? They obviously have to go through some difficult times when no one is watching. Mm, such a great question. You know, this whole conversation that the world and especially America is having about DEI, meaning diversity, equity, and inclusion. You know, so many times when we are hired, people believe that we are a token hire, meaning that we're not qualified for the job, but we're hiring you because you fit our so-called DEI initiatives. We want to make sure that we have people of color. We want to make sure that we're diverse. But what they fail to realize is we're not just qualified. We're more than qualified because as blacks, and let's just keep it real, we're having a real conversation. We are all told that you have to be 10 times better. So when I come to the table, you best believe my best is better than your best. Mm -hmm. My best mm -hmm. is always going to be better than your best. Because I have to be better than I'm, better than you. So, sorry about that. No, oh, that's pretty dope. But uh, he appears on the podcast. Very, uh, okay, the podcast, is, it, so. at the, is that at the I dog? The dog? That's Rico, my little shih tzu. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, knowing that, I, I think about the depositions and their excuses for why I was treated differently. They actually had the nerve to say, well, Andrea was coming to work unprepared. Oh, okay. Andrea didn't come to work with story ideas. Andrea, or we only gave photographers. The reason why she wasn't getting photographers is because we give photographers to the people who come in with a game plan. I mean, the gaslighting and the lies yeah. were just crazy. And it was interesting because I sat there during the depositions. And you know, as we can do, especially as black women, let's keep it real. We have a look. We have a little look. And I sat there and it was so interesting to just watch them squirm. Like that was the best for me because you can tell they were trying to create a storyline that really, they were lies. The storylines were lies, but they say it in such a way that I think they really believe it. You know, they really want to believe that because they know that there was no legitimate reason why my stories weren't being aired why I didn't have access to photographers when I requested them. Oh, wow. My stories were passed over. Why a franchise took six months for me to do, but yet my co-anchor, who happens to be a white woman, she was allowed to do pretty much whatever she wanted to. She was dictating oh, wow. what I was doing. And I found this out because she was technically demoted off of the 6 p.m. I, after 15 years, was finally promoted to the 6 p.m. Sure. And instead of getting what most people would think would be a public promotion, meaning there's a press release, people internally know that you've been promoted to the six and the community knows that you've been promoted to the six. They didn't do any of that. Oh, wow. They didn't do any of that, but they gave her a managerial role and then told me, you don't get a financial promotion because this is duties as a sign. Oh, wow. And you know, it reminded me of being, you know, the, Oh, good old days of, I shouldn't call them good old days, but the old days, the historical mm -hmm. days of, of sharecropping. And I just said, what I'm not going to do is continue to show up, do great, great work, be professional, continue to bring ratings in for your station. You're right. making money off of my name and my likeness, but you don't want to share. Oh, you wow. don't want to treat me right. You don't want to hold people accountable. So what am I left to do? Why should I stay? This isn't working mm -hmm. for me. And so mm -hmm. I tell people all the time, you can divorce your job. Mm -hmm. You can divorce your job. Getting a divorce can be an issue of one party. Only one party needs to agree that they don't want to be there anymore. That's right. Just That's right. They can come around and say, we're going to dismiss you or we're reducing um, you know, our employment force 
or we're, we're going to let you go or whatever the case may be, we can also say, I'm out of here. I don't want to work right. for you anymore. We can actually choose. So for, you know, when it comes to DEI, you know, it's not, we're not tokens. We are doing our jobs. Sure. The reality is the powers that be don't want to respect who we are as professionals. And again, I just have had enough and it was time to walk away. And I'm literally thriving in a way that I never, that I knew was possible because I had worked in great places before. So I knew that this was a little different, but you know, my situation was really complex because, you know, when I was, um, when I got there back in 1999, when the main female anchor decided to retire, there was this belief that I would be kind of a sin to the five, six, and 11. Sure, and sure. instead what they decided to do, the game changed. All of a sudden it's, oh, we're not gonna have an A and a B team. We're gonna have all four anchors are now going to be equal. So in essence, we're gonna bring somebody else in who doesn't look like you. We're going to put them at the number one show at 6 p.m. And you basically just do what we tell you to do. So for 15 years, I didn't say a word, but I knew what that was all about. Mm -hmm. I continued to work. I continued to show up, be professional, do my job. And when it was time to, when they finally decided to promote me 15 years later, it was a slap in the face. And I just thought, you know what? The days of sharecropping are over. I'm not sure. going to do your bidding sure. for you. I'm not going to bring you ratings. I'm not going to make you money. And you're taking advantage of me. And I'm just supposed to sit back and be okay with that. Sure. Those days are over. Sure. You know, t t you know I like to, I like to kind of, dig a little bit deeper into what you just talked about mm -hmm. you know there, there are there, there are some folks you know who understand that you know the, the the work environment has not always been the best it's always lean you know more towards one side than the other you know what what message can we or, or what if, if you think about something that can be created to to create dialogue because i think what one thing that's missing is honest and authentic dialogue between those who uh, who, who pull the purse strings versus those who um, who drive the business. You know, we both know that employees drive businesses, not leaders and things of that nature. And so in your opinion, based on what you're building with your podcast, My Silence is Not For Sale, what, what do you feel needs to happen to bridge some gaps that that may exist that that uh that is kind of uncomfortable for people to talk about yeah you know nothing changes until we have uncomfortable conversations i mean think about it from a historical standpoint if we look at the civil rights movement you know none of that was comfortable it wasn't i mean rosa parks it wasn't comfortable um standing up to the powers that be it's never comfortable um telling people that change has to happen and i and change must happen and we demand change you know, it doesn't happen unless we are involved and we cannot be involved if we're not clear about what the mission is. And we can't be clear what the mission is if we're not discussing what the issues and the problems are. Yeah, and sure. so, yes, it might be uncomfortable for them, but if we don't have these conversations, then nothing will change. Everything will, will remain the same. And so my purpose of being able to talk about this is to give agency to all of us that it is okay for us to have these uncomfortable conversations. If we don't, then we will never improve. And, and I believe that all of us, we do, all of us have a right to thrive. And so, yes, is it uncomfortable for me to talk about to someone about, you know, your implicit bias? It's not uncomfortable for me, but it might be uncomfortable for the person I'm talking to, but if they don't do their work, then nothing changes. If, is it an uncomfortable conversation to talk about the fact that in 21 years, I never once had a black manager. I never once had a person of color who was a news director, an executive producer, someone who was sitting at the table managing the daily, um, you know, ins and outs of the of the of the day at the sure. at the TV station. You know, those days of not just sitting at the table, but being able to have influence over what we cover, how we cover it, right. making those decisions, those major decisions that affect all of our lives. If we're not at the table and if we're not, if we're not at the table and we're not part of the conversation, then nothing changes. Sure. So the level of discomfort is really on them. And I think that really tells more and speaks more about who they are and the fact that they don't want to make changes because they know that they're in a position of power and authority and they decide who gets to sit at the table. 
And if they don't want people who look like us, what can I do? What can I say? I mean, I can say that's unfair, but they run the show. It's kind of like, like when you go to Vegas and, you know, people say the dealer always wins. I mean, the dealer always wins. It's their game. It's their table. I might win a couple of, you know, a couple of times, a couple of hands here and there. Sure, but at sure. the end of the day, the house will win. The house sure. always wins. It was their house. It wasn't my house. And that's when I said, I need to create and build my own house. Sure. You know, you, you're, you're writing a book right now uh, entitled My Silence is Not for Sale. And you also have a podcast. Talk right. about how that title originated and, and why is it so significant yeah. to, 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 your, to your mission to, uh, to transform lives? Well, after I left on June 5th, 2020, we began the EEOC process, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. I filed against the, the station and we had to go through that process first for, it took about maybe six or seven months. There was a mediation process where, you know, the powers that be and I was there along with my husband and the mediator and we talked about the issues and it became very, very clear to me that they were never interested in holding people accountable. You know, they said, well, the general manager and the former general manager and the news director, they all want you to come back. And I kept saying to myself, yeah, but you're not talking about the changes that I'm asking that need to be made, holding people accountable, including the news director. In fact, all three of them, all, all of them were complicit in allowing the lack of accountability to take place. And they were also involved in what I call a cover up, the cover up mm -hmm. of trying to create a scenario and a narrative that just wasn't right, that would, that would really were lies and making sure that they were protected. They wanted to protect their own jobs. They wanted to protect their friends. And of course, they don't look like me. I was not part of that in crowd. And so self-preservation is something else. When people are trying to save their own lives, they will pretty much do, not everyone, but um, you know, they will do whatever they have to do to, to save and protect themselves. Sure. Sure. But during that mediation process, the general manager made a statement that I will never, ever forget. And, you know, I want people to understand that I'm in a business where it's all about sound bites. When I'm going out and covering stories, you know, we have a, a short amount of time. We're in and out. We've got to get this, get the story. I'm running back to the station. I'm looking at the tapes and I'm putting it all together. But as I'm doing that interview, I'm also listening for what we call sound bites. So that way I'm like, okay, I'm going to use that sound bite. I'm going to use what this person said here. So that way, when I get back to the station, I know exactly what I'm going to use. I can pull that sound out, write my story, give it to the editor. We're on at five o'clock. So we don't have a lot of time to turn stories around. So I've lived my life in sound bites. And I remember sound bites that stick out from stories that I did with President Obama and, sure. and First Lady Michelle Obama. Like I remember those conversations. So my life is always in sound bites. And there's one thing he said was that we're not going to give you a golden parachute. Mm. And mm. basically what he was saying is we're not going to pay you any money. We're not going to settle out of court because we don't want you to ride off into the sunset and live your better than best life. And mm. so it became apparent to me that while they're, they're, they were talking about money, trying to mitigate their liability. And I was asking for accountability. And they're two totally polar opposites. The two sure. cannot coexist. And so we go through the mediation process. I'm given the right to sue in federal court. There are a lot of legal things that go on between the scenes or behind the scenes and trying to decide whether or not I'm actually going to get to go to a jury trial. And during this process, we finally were able to depose them, which of course they fought naturally. And for me, that was a win. It was a win to be able to sit there and watch them squirm and lie and to watch how far people will go to hide the truth and to not hold people accountable. But when I realized that that's what it was all about for them, it became clear to me that during that uh, the settlement time when we were deciding, okay, we, there are two options. Both parties are going to put their summary judgments out, out present it to the judge. The federal judge is going to read theirs, read mine, and decide, okay, who do I believe? Does this need to continue to go forward? And, you know, it's a very tricky time. You wonder whether or not, you know, if the judge decides to, to err or, or to vote for the not vote, but to say, okay, we're going to go ahead and, 
and um, give and grant them summary judgment, which means, Andrea, you can't sue them anymore, and the case is over, and case is dismissed, and they, in fact, want win, I had to really weigh the cost between what's really important. Is it is it more important for me to walk away with whatever you know they offered and take my lumps and keep moving? Or can this moment be used to help other people? And so on a Thursday before that Monday, when we had a 12.30 p.m. deadline to let them know whether or not I would accept their settlement offer, I took a walk and I literally prayed and I said, God, what do you want me to do with this? Because for me, it was clear for them, it was about money. They were trying to mitigate their financial liability. And for me, my whole desire was to kind of parade all of the players of evil in court because I wanted the truth to be told. I wanted everyone to hear what really happened. And I did not want to, I didn't want the judge to say, nothing to see here, Andrea, sorry, you know, you lose. And for them to walk away, I wanted to, I wanted to raise awareness about the truth. I wanted people to know what really, really happened. And so for me, it became, you know, if I, if they had won or if I had taken the settlement, I would have had to have signed an NDA, meaning I could never talk about the case again. I take the money and I ride off into the sunset. And it just became clear to me as I was walking, I said, God, what do you want me to do? And he audibly, when I say I heard his voice, he literally said, don't do it because I want you to use this for greater good. And at the time, I was reading John Lewis's memoir, Walking with the Wind. And there's a part in his book on page 64 that literally set the tone for me in terms of what I was going to do. And he said, you know, there's sometimes in life, there's this, this what you call the spirit of history, where there's something that pulls you, that, that pulls you so hard that you can't, you can't shake it off. There's a moment, there's a spirit that draws you that says, I need you to do this for the greater good of mankind. And that is it. So for me, I answer the call to the spirit of history. What I'm doing is part of history. What I'm doing, trying to help people understand what workplace bullying is all about, gaslighting, how to walk away, how to plan your case if you decide True. to to you know sue your employer, what to do um, even afterwards, how do you go through the process of getting therapy, how do you fund it? How do you fund a legal case? Because suing, being part of the, the judicial system is very expensive. Sure, and no sure. one asks for this. And so for me, it was my silence. I'm not going to allow you to pay me off to make me quiet about the truth. I'm a journalist. Wow, wow. that's right. I'm that's right. So you can't have pay been. me. My silence is well. not for sale. I'm not going to trade my silence for money. So what I'm doing is helping other people, women, black people, it doesn't matter, just people in general understand what their rights are and how do we navigate a system that was not made for us to really be part of. And that's yeah. the truth. You know, you, you know, you know, I, you know I, I can remember you doing a video, uh, you were on a deck uh, and you sat down, there were flowers behind you and you announced, you know, that you had cancer. And so during that time, you were going through whatever you were going through at that time. And so talk about your mental state at that time as you delivered that message to, um, to the, the, you know, the, the citizens of, of Indianapolis. You know what, uh, that was such, like, I remember it like it was yesterday. Um, it was interesting because the day before, we were in Florida on a little va little vacation. It was in April of 2018. And I had to come back to MC, an event that was um, raising money for breast cancer, or for cancer support community. And it's for all kinds of cancers. And that was on a Saturday night. And on Sunday, I'll just be real, I was taking my bra off and all of a sudden I felt like a little pain. I was like, ooh. So I had Archie take a look at it and he touched it. And I was like, oh, that really hurts. Mm -hmm. And so I looked back at that. Had it not been for that event that Saturday night, the night before, I probably would would never have thought, oh, well, let me go get it checked out. Right. I had never had a, a mammogram, unfortunately. And I, I look back at that, and I think the reason is because I was just so busy working. You know, life, life, True. life, True. life. you're busy working, you're trying to, you know, you're taking care of the kids, you're up here and there. And, and a lot of times as women or just people in general, we put our health on the back burner. 
And I was one of those people where I was doing stories about breast cancer, doing stories about taking care of your health, but I was not. But it was also living in silence with all the microaggressions that were going on. Sure. So it, it was all happening at the same time. And so what I remember when I delivered the announcement, actually I did, not they, they announced it on TV. Um, they made the announcement because as soon as I found out that I had cancer, we, immediately I was like, I'm out. <laughs> I got to yeah, start to yeah. chemo. Right. I had the most aggressive form for black women, which is triple negative breast cancer. Sure, we had sure. a, almost a <clears throat> over 50% um, return rate. And I just said, I got to fight this. Thank God I was stage one. But I just think about had I continued to ignore the pain, had I continued to just keep working and trying to navigate the hostile environment, I may not be sitting here talking to you today. Right. So all of that was happening at the same time. And it just was a moment for me where I thought, okay, Lord, what do I need to do? <laughs> you know, um, <clears throat> chemo, um, you know, then it was the, the surgery followed by the radiation. Then I had another year of immunotherapy treatment. So I mean, for, it was a two and a half year journey. I just got my wow. cord out last year. Yeah. So yeah. this is, it, it, it was a long physical journey for me. But I look at that and I remember thinking to myself during chemo, and even when I was in the bed at home trying to recuperate, when my bones were brittle, I was, you know, just physically ill. As, as if anyone has ever had to care for someone with cancer, sure, I mean, sure. it's horrible. I, I don't wish it on anyone. But I kept saying, Lord, if you, I was making deals with God. I said, God, please save me. Because I had the yeah, time. I yeah. had, a, I had a, a sixth grader, a sixth, seventh grader. And I said, I've got to be around for Ian. I gotta be around my husband, I gotta be around for my family. Like there's so much more for us to do. And and here you we weren't even supposed to have children. So Ian came, he was a, a, a surprise kid. And so I, I thought, God, you can't give me this blessing and then take me away from him. You can't take his mother away. So I fought. I fought as much as I could, as hard as I could, so that I could still be here. <clears throat> and during that time, I said, God, if you save me, I promise I will continue to dedicate my life to serving you, sure. but also serving other people, because that's what journalism is. It's a service. I believe it's sure. a ministry. It's a ministry for information, a ministry to raise awareness. It's a ministry to inspire people and for people to aspire as well. Sure, to sure. Life. And sure. that's why I got into the business. And it's also to hold institutions and people accountable. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it just hit me. I said, well, when I get out of this, because I knew I was going to survive. God said, girl, I'm going to let you live. I'm going to let you live, but I got some work for you to do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and when oh, I made yeah. that step, you say, okay, all right. I heard you. I, I heard you. I just didn't know the magnitude of the fight that I was going to be in after I came out, after, you know, I had um, gone through the radiation. I came back, I was promoted, of course, as we know, didn't get the financial reward that comes along with it. Nobody in the city knew that I was actually promoted to the 6 p.m. anchor. You know, I'm like, I did all this for 15 years and it just started hitting me. I'm like, right. Oh, I'm now alive, but I'm not happy. Right. I mean, it was really as simple as that. I'm alive, but now I'm not even happy doing this. I'm not happy being here right. anymore. And I just knew that there was a better life. And that's when I began my own personal journey of holding people accountable. Sure, when I understood sure. what was going on, it became kind of funny where I'm like, wow, they are really, really, they don't even know who I am. They have no idea that I know what they're doing. And right. the more I became, the stronger I became, the more resolute I became in who I was as a person, what I sure. wanted, what I deserved. It, it became easy. It was an easy decision for me to walk away. And I just said, God, I trust you. I sure. trust that you will replenish, that you will restore, that you will give everything back to me that I lost and then some. Sure. Now, has the three-year journey since I left been easy? Absolutely not. Has uh, Have there been moments of depression and like, I don't know, God, what are you doing? Absolutely. But I but I do it all over again because I'm the happiest I've ever been. The yeah. happiest. And yeah. I look back to that and go, that was pretty... Compared to the cancer, like that was worse than the cancer fight. Oh wow, that's that's a, big statement. that's a big statement. That's a big statement. That's a big statement. It was it was wow. worse than the cancer. And I know for a lot of people, they're like, "Okay, Andrea, you looked happy all the time when you were on the air." And I'm like, "Well, I'm, I'm a professional." Yeah. And there used to be funny. <laughs> Jim, mom and dad would say, "Girl, you were so good tonight, and you were laughing and yucking it up." And I, I mean, you should get an Oscar. Like, if only people knew. And I'm like, I know. If only people yeah. knew. 
Yeah. And that's the violence that yeah. I'm talking about is that they're not, we're not telling them exactly how we feel. We're not telling right. them, I need you to hold people accountable. We're not sure. holding management or HR accountable. We're just going with the flow because at the end of the day, we're trying to get our bag. And I get it. We're working for livelihoods. We're working that's for right. what we love to do, but we're also working for to maintain a livelihood. And walking away from my livelihood, it was a huge risk. But wow. my soul was more was worth more than money. That's right. Again, my silence is not for sale. There you go. You know what? There, there's someone who's watching, uh, you know, this episode, mm -hmm. and they have gone through probably what you've gone through, and, and maybe even more. What words of encouragement do you have for them to move forward, to never give up, to persevere? To, ha to be tenacious, to address the challenges they may be facing that's impacting them, not just physically, but emotionally and, you know, even mentally. What do yeah. you what do you say to them? You know, you, you touched on the words that I love, which is, you know, perseverance and never giving up and pushing through. You know, if there's anything a cancer fight will teach you is how to push through. Um, it takes away the fear. I mean, you're fearful in the beginning, but over time you begin to build a, a, a spirit of resiliency and a spirit of perseverance. And you begin to think, okay, if I can beat cancer, if I can win this battle, everything else is easy. I mean, really, if I can win this, that's small potatoes. I got that. But I think for me, it is the notion, and this is why I'm, I'm being outspoken about what happened to me. It's because we have been suffering in silence for so long. We hold it in. We talk about it with our girlfriends. We talk about it to our spouses, our partners, our friends. You know, we're on the phone when we get home or we're in the car. So as we get in the car, we're like, girl, let me tell you what happened today. But we're not telling the people who really need to hear it. And That's what right. we're doing is we're actually complicit in allowing the behavior to continue because we're not holding people accountable. We're not having those uncomfortable conversations. We're not holding HR accountable. We're not holding our leaders and managers account accountable. We're not holding companies accountable to create a safe environment for all of us to thrive in. And it just became clear to me that it, as I mentioned earlier, it was just time to go. So for someone who was going through a sim similar scenario, I say, surround yourself with people who get it, who understand, who mm -hmm. will validate your feelings. I think that's what I really needed was for someone to validate, someone who wasn't my family to validate that what I knew intellectually and in my heart was real because I was confused. I'm like, wait a minute, is it me or is this them? Yeah, or is it a combination of, of, of the two of us? Or what more can I do? And when I realized that there was nothing more that I could do, that it was clear, clearly abusive, it was time for me to start planning my exit strategy and to walk away. And so that's why it's important for us to have these conversations, for us to sure. really talk about what really happened, to speak the truth. Because when we speak truth, it releases the negativity, the toxins that we have stored up inside of our bodies because sure. we've been holding on for it for so long. But when we talk about it, you realize that someone else is going through the same thing. Sure. Because a lot of times we, we think we're the only ones because we're we're afraid to, to speak truth to power. We're afraid to that if we talk about it, we're going to get in trouble. If we mention it to someone, they're going to go tell somebody else. And then all of a sudden, I'm going to be retaliated against. Those are real fears because sure. I was retaliated against. Those are real fears. But you have to love your life. You have to love yourself more than the fear. You have to have courage. And you have to know that you deserve the best. You deserve the better than best life that anyone can offer you. And if you can't take care of yourself, if you don't do it yourself, no one else will. So my advice is to persevere, find resiliency, have courage, don't be afraid. Speak to someone, a therapist, someone who understands what you're going through, who can validate your feelings, and to not be silent. Because when you speak it, you're allowing the truth to go before you, to prepare another place for you, to prepare another lane, to prepare a sure. new journey. You're manifesting all of that. The universe is opening up, up to you. And I just said, Lord, I don't know how you're going to restore me, but I trust you. I trust you. And like I said, it's been difficult, but... The other side is so much better than where I was before. I mean, I'm 54 and I keep, and people keep telling me that I look younger than I ever did before. And it's because I'm happy. I am at peace. I have joy. And where there is joy, it's kind of like that, that, that um, song back in church, joy unspeakable and full of yeah. glory. 
that's where I am in my life right now. There's nothing, there's no amount of money. There's no amount of money that will ever shut me up from speaking the truth. Right. Especially when I know my experience and my truth will help somebody else. That's my purpose in life. Wow. And God said, all right, girl, you made a promise. I'm going to hold you to it. Do your thing. Do your thing. Ladies and gentlemen, hey, you've been listening to Miss Andrea Moorhead, and we want to encourage you to visit her um, uh, YouTube channel, My Silence Is Not For Sale. And that's mysilenceisnotforsale.com right there on the tickler. We want to encourage you. She has, and I, and I told her, I said, you know what? I, I've watched some of your episodes, and they are powerful. Just okay. you know what this this channel will, this channel will do. And, and again, I know she's not doing this for numbers, but this channel will will, will probably be one of the premier channels in in, in, in YouTube uh, uh, university of uh, the the atmosphere, what have you, because it is powerful. She takes a a, a very uh, a practical approach to what all of us have probably experienced. At one, at one time or another. <clears throat> and so again, we want to thank you for being who you are. You know, as I've always told you, as I've, and I, I can remember, you know, being, you know, on the beach in Florida. And I told you, I said, hey, I said, you know what? You are strong. You are resilient. You are a great mother. You are a great person. And you know what? My family and I, we are totally uh just excited to be around you guys when we when we are and again, oh, we're so we feel the same way about you guys we do we're so honored to call you friends and family absolutely you're, absolutely you're, you're, you're fan, friends and family we are so so honored and i want to say something too dix before we leave is that you know this isn't just about airing dirty laundry because one is not dirty it just is what it is it's the, it's yeah. the truth that happened but again there's power in numbers i believe when there's a collective where we are together as a group when we are, have a collective voice of people, we are stronger than those naysayers. We are stronger than the bullies. We're stronger than the hostile work environments. We're stronger together. And when we work together to talk about this issue and we bring it into the forefront, you know, this isn't just about airing the dirty laundry and the stories. Sure. Sure. This isn't just about victims coming forward and sharing their stories. This is using our stories to help create those uncomfortable conversations. And now let's talk about the solutions. What are the solutions? We can talk about it until we're in the face, but I'm all about what is the solution so that this doesn't have to happen to anyone else? What What are the solutions so that victims as well as witnesses are protected so that sure. people feel comfortable coming forward so that they're not going to be retaliated against? What are the solutions so that we can change laws so that instead of us going to HR, my per, my idea is we need to create a independent body that that investigates claims. So that way we're not relegated to HR because their interest is to protect the company. It really sure, is not. Exactly. Exactly. Maybe HR is not your friend. And I think there are a lot of young people who don't realize that. And I want and I say it again. Hashtag HR is not your friend. Use them for <laughs> onboarding. Use yeah. them for 401k information. Benefits. <laughs> for a disability information. Use yeah. them when you need to know, you know, your PTO has changed. Use them when you are signing up for new health care, whatever. But sure. don't go to them for, and don't expect for them to necessarily be on your side. That's just the truth. That's sure. the matter. And sure. I'm sure, sure that there are people in the HR department are going, that's not true. Well, nine times out of 10, that is true. Yeah. So we are talking about how do how do you protect yourself if you're ever in a situation like this? And then what can we do from a statewide state laws that will protect people from discrimination and bullying? And what do we need to, to do on a federal level? So I'm working with um, a group called End Workplace Bullying. They are right now pushing legislation in Massachusetts. Okay. Pennsylvania is now doing the same thing. I'm going to be there in early January. I'm going to be meeting with legislators in Indiana so that we can have a similar legislation there to help protect sure, this. Sure, sure. Because this has to stop. It has to stop. It just seems as if the bad seeds are the ones that continue to unfortunately grow. And those of us who are the victims and witnesses, we're the ones who are not thriving. And we're the ones having to walk away. And that's just simply not fair. We need sure. to be about the business of 
getting rid of the bad apples, the bad seeds, so that all of us can, can work in an environment that is productive and, and where we can thrive, where we can truly live and be our authentic selves. Sure. You know, it's, it's funny. You, you mentioned, I know we got to get off here, but you mentioned, I'm so <laughs> you mentioned, no, no, but you, you, you know, I'm, I'm an HR. Well, my, my background is HR. Mm -hmm. And you know what? There's a whole nother layer of HR folks who experience the bullying because you know what? If you don't, if you don't play the game from an HR yeah. standpoint, that's a whole nother level of bullying. And, you know, because 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 I mean, because again, HR is there to protect the organization ultimately. Yeah. And so again, that's a whole nother episode. Maybe we can get some HR folks on here and talk mm -hmm. about that. But hey, again, 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 it's been it's been a true it's been truly a a pleasure to have you on, and you know, hey, we yes, will sir. have to do this again. This, this is your second time on, and so I know this time you're on by yourself. Make sure you tell your dad. Yeah, yeah. Make sure you tell your dad. Yeah. 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 I said, Ruth, you're good. All right. Well, let me tell you. I'm excited about the future, and this is when I know that I'm doing the right thing. I wake up every morning, and I have over a dozen emails text messages and or something in LinkedIn where people are asking me, can you give me advice? What can I do? Sure. What are some resources? That's sure. when I know that I'm doing the right thing. I've had people who used to work at that station who have sent me messages saying, it happened to me too. I just left. And they're looking at me going, wow, thank you so much for speaking up because I thought it was just me. Grown men and women who are still traumatized by the trauma. And when I know that I have helped them feel released that I have given them the power to speak up, yeah. I know I'm on the right path.